making a life worth living and retirement worth having is about the people in our life. When I first came into a problem, I literally went to my father and I said, Dad, what should I do? There's someone who's violating my rights and lying in my records and legally, illegally pretending to be me or changing my records in some way without my permission. I don't know who is doing this. And so my father at the time, who was still alive, said, well, you can call my family friend or my colleague, this man named Jim. He might be able to help you in some way. I literally had tried other chains of opportunities to fix the problem. I called through quality assurance. I called through HR. I called up to the line of the CEO of that organization, and it didn't stop. When I talked to Jim, he made it sound like he could help. Would I be willing to talk to a police officer? And would I be willing to state what was stolen? At the time, just one thing, a medication prescription was taken. That turned into a real problem. He ended up sending two officers, one of whom was allegedly a mental health person, and in that rights were taken away. My sibling didn't like that I was staying in her home. She's a bit of a hoarder, and she literally got me taken off to mental health. I was held against my will for more than a week. I missed a business conference when I was going to sell my book. And every time I start to stand up, my siblings literally hit me into the ground to the point that I have no money at all. It is a truthful experience that I'm talking about. I had a therapist while my father was transitioning and I was struggling with a few issues going forward of what do I do now after I've lost a life spouse, a life partner. Regardless of the legalities of that situation, which is no one's concern but mine, I had the right to seek that counsel from someone who professed to be caring and open to my situation. Since that time, I have observed that that individual has a photocopy and a photocopier of my life. I'm not sure how that's possible. When I learned this, I discovered that my eldest siblings wrote an eight-page document about my life and handed it in to an Arab individual who was a physician who literally decided to place a note on my file that was against my rights and literally not his right to do because he never was a part of my process. He never was someone I would accept any information from, regardless of what happened in that situation, because of the lies that were told. Only a few people in that situation understood. The person who was in charge of um, basically preventing fraud and other things, and I forget what she's called, risk management, thank you, is literally the one who provided me a copy of that eight-page document. It created a violent reaction in me because I had the right to privacy and so did the women I had loved in my life. That individual attack on my life and betrayal of all my information put into a medical record has left me with a problem. It's been going on since 2015. I am still being hazed and harassed by people who may actually be family members pretending this way so that they can try and walk me out of my life that I rightfully earned long, long ago. When a person goes through a loss of a spouse, they really feel it and they grieve it. They grieve it completely. In my family, my spouse, who was from a foreign land, was not always given the dignity and regard she deserved. My father loved her and cared for her and helped me in times of trouble. When our son was waywardly, he produced help. He also produced money when it was necessary because of how things impacted my right to earn when my son was out of whack. I can't go into all the details because, frankly, it's not your business. But you have to understand that a man like me has rights just like you do. When I tell this story, you don't recognize your own rights because this has never happened to you, probably. That was one year. I left immediately. I went on the road in my homelessness and I produced a life. It wasn't easy. I had help only from my mother. She provided me less than, I think it was $200 a month to live on. So let's think about that in today's economy, how hard it is to live on $200. What do you spend $200 on for your life? Probably a utility bill, at least. A cell phone bill, possibly. Possibly a couple bills, together. But I was using it merely for gas and food. I did have some of my own money. But the problem was that my life had been harmed so much in those days, and at that point in my life, I had no established credit because we didn't live on the ide ideology in our faith practice of credit. 
We believed in some of the faith principles that you don't live on credit in life. You only get credit when you really need it or when there's an emergency. I wasn't paying attention to those things because we lived within our means and everything that we produced was basically for our business practice in the Japanese language classroom. Anything else came from marketing, training work, which was also a training aspect of being a teacher, a trainer, an educator. I probably changed what I was each year in taxes because I didn't really care what the title was and I didn't think it mattered too much. When I talk like this, people don't get how hard it is to pay taxes when you're having to write off every expense, pay attention to every detail of every receipt, and someone comes along and monkeys with your receipt system. Now, when we produce a life worth living and retirement worth having, we have to produce an income to do that. I provided for my family of three quite well on half-time income. I wasn't thinking about retirement in those days, and when I did broach the subject, I had a life partner who didn't want to talk about it much. I think she was still worrying about how we were going to produce that long-term relationship in the economy, in the situations at hand, and practically in the legalities of our lives. It's just a matter of fact, of course. The laws literally changed a lot over the course of time is not true. That people's rights are often denied based on people's attitudes about their rights. In the next year, I had family hit me again illegally. I accidentally had a problem with someone and they decided to turn it into a financial situation and litigation abuse. I've experienced litigation abuse from my middle sister quite regularly. I've experienced psychological abuse from my eldest sister on a regular daily basis now. I've experienced financial abuse with my youngest sister, who's older than me actually, because she manages my mother's money and I've asked for a simple loan once a month to handle $100 in charges and when she was supposed to pay it, she didn't. My mother told me that it was paid, it wasn't. And it's true, she's helping me with a few other things, but right now I'm not producing an income and where do we go when we are not producing an income and we have bills to pay? We go to family. And if they have the means and if they have the wherewithal and if they have the kindness in their souls under the, the laws of the Bible that says we help people who are impoverished, we do help. She helped a lot less because of their influence in her life. My brother would often race into town, pick her up and take her off without telling me. At that time, she was kind of my only mode of transportation. So what I see going on for my life is a family uh, intentional attack on my right to live and be successful that every single piece of my property that I left in storage carefully put and organized has almost come into my paperwork, into my car and other things. While I traveled, particularly in Indiana, I was constantly being stolen from, hazed every single time I stopped and slept someplace to be safe. They put their hands into a groin pouch that had 300 some dollars in it, 400 maybe, I don't remember now, and that was stolen from me. That was in my pants, in my underwear, safekeeping so that pickpockets in Indiana couldn't take it out of my wallet. I had a lot of things stolen from me. I've had a lot of paperwork physically ruined. You know, papers are usually kept pristine, but all my business cards, all my prayer cards, all my candle related cards in my altar have been destroyed literally by this attack. Almost every person that I reach out to, I don't get a response back from, and I have to wonder, who's the one who's been isolating me all this time? The only people when I tell the story think about is they think it's my siblings. They think there's a mental health attack on my life, and they have tried to do this several times. They literally are monitoring my legal situations, which is not their lawful right to do. They've interfered with my records, which is also not their lawful right to do. And they've involved police on a regular basis, but it's not their lawful right to do. It's not exactly true. It's that their lies was what causes the betrayals and the lack of productivity is literally because when I try to do things, somebody's monkeying around to interfere with my right to do it. Now, when I talk like this, you may or may not believe it, but what if this was going on in your life? The reason I tell my story is because to, as forewarning to other people to pay attention to the people that they allow in their life. I have one gal pal friend that I really care for a lot to the point that we had such intimate conversations that I wanted to propose to her. I literally went to that home in winter. I produced the three years of gifts I had painstakingly held in my adult closet for the long time for her and her children to be prepared for that proposal. It was a freezing cold day. I was so tired of waiting to see her after three years and how many times the Lord said, not yet, not yet. 
but I didn't listen in that moment of time. Now, I'm not going to sell what happened on that porch. I'm not going to share that private aspect of my life. I'm just saying that in life, we have moments of time to make a difference. And that person accused me of doing things in her life that monkeyed up her life. And there's no way that's possible. All I've ever produced for her is love, kindness, support, professional care. That's been my life. I care for people. I show them regard. I show them respect. And I don't monkey with their lives unless they piss me off. And what I mean by that is that I'm a shopper. I work hard for my money. Particularly right now in my homelessness, I work exceptionally hard for my money. I have to walk places. I have to talk to people. I have to sell. That's what you do when you don't have a job. I don't know what people think people do once they lose their jobs. If you're a millionaire, if you've had a huge fashionable, fashionable model career, you probably got money in the bank and you could go live quietly on a very low budget in a little town somewhere in the woods and no one would ever know you were there. A lot of famous people do that after Hollywood. But I'm not making fun of those folks. I'm just saying people produce a life of money and the money is what fuels their economy and the economy is fueled by investments. Those investments are produced by people purchasing products and services in businesses. And my point is that when I take my hard-earned dollars, hard dollars and discretionary income into a restaurant or into a place, I expect the fundamental expectation of our current level of society and technology to be treated with dignity, regard, and respect for my money investment. I don't expect some flippant little girl to be laughing and carrying on and making fun of me, how I look, how I dress, how I smell if I've gone to an athletic situation or I'm just working out through the fact that I walk everywhere. And I know that's kind of an old fashioned way of workout. It's how men of old used to stay in shape. They would go for walks with each other. They would talk on long those walks. They would carry things. They would produce things. They rode horses. There was a lot of different life way back then. I've come to learn a great deal about those things, but truthfully, it doesn't matter what I think about my life or what you think about my life. What really matters is the opportunity to make a life again. And when people interfere intentionally and immorally in God's plan for my life, ruining my relationship with that gal that I was longing to marry and literally making it impossible through technology for me to say, look, we need to have a conversation. I need closure with this after seven years. And openly, God keeps saying, hang on, hang on, hang on. I need to know what the hell I'm hanging on for. Because in order to validate what we feel God is telling us by the signs and signals and the things that give us light and life in our, in our hearts and our minds and our soul, love is that thing. Most people produce an income because they have a loving partner, children to love on, or other people beyond themselves and just loving their own lives to pay for. When I talk like this, I hope I make total utter sense, that it's nonsensical information, that it means that you are literally getting what this is about for me, that when someone decided to keep demoralizing me every single second of the day and night, I am literally raging in my soul like any man would. When a woman insults a man, he is upset. But when it's a constant form of abuse and battery of psychological warfare and gaslighting, it is exhausting. And a man at some point wants to do what a man wants to do, which is to smack somebody across the face and say, stop it now. This is childish crap. You have a life. Go live your life. Leave mine alone. But there are people in this land that don't do that. There are teenagers who think they're going to play police with whoever the hell has called them and say, go ahead, slip something into that drink. Make sure that person stays put. Don't let them leave. We're coming. Whatever. Producing a game on someone's life because they're playing games on their computers, on their phones, with their friends, on Xboxes or whatever they're called today, Playstations. But nobody's thinking about the impact to another human being's life and whether or not any of what they're being told is true or not. In life, people can ruin records for other people. My records for my life have been totally stolen from my home in a place that should have been regarding my right to the privacy of my documents, my paperwork, my possessions, and every other little thing that was being paid for in that rent of that place. When someone got in and started stealing the gifts I had set aside lovingly for upcoming Christmas, I was upset, livid, beyond control. Those apartment people didn't show any regard for the facts. They didn't do anything other than, well, you should produce a police report then. No, they should have been involved in interrogating, investigating their own people. 
All I saw was people who lied, stole, and cheated me out of a life. Now that's my opinion. This is my column. I can talk about it any way I want to because it was my experience, according to my sister. But when she says that, she reminds me of someone that I had some therapy with. That he would literally patronize me with, I can understand that's what you feel is your experience. No, that literally is factually what happened to me, unless you were participating in the theft and harm of my life, the rape of my body, the shaving of my legs. Men know how many hairs they have on their head, how many hairs they have on their face, how many hairs they have across their body. They literally know these things. When a person wakes up in an uncomfortable situation with clothes removed and legs shaved, they're going to be beyond livid, not to mention feeling very upset. In a lot of ways, on a lot of levels that are natural, the soulful level is the most important. Now, when I talk like this, there'll be family members who say, that's not true, we didn't do this. But why is it that when I told people that my bags were being cut, that siblings didn't react at all? Because possibly, as in any good who whodunit, they're the ones who literally did it. Because it's usually the ones who did it that don't react. It's not like this is rocket science, people. Investigating people isn't that hard. You just take them into a room, you ask them questions. But there are people who will lie about the answers they get, which we've seen on every good PBS program of that uh, early world detective. That even people in official capacity will lie on someone's record to avoid having to handle any situation that it might actually have helped them if they had just taken the time to listen. The lack of listening skills today is our biggest challenge. The lack of people recognizing they're representing a CEO of their firm and that their entire career path might be impacted, impeded, negated if they do the wrong thing in life. You see, we seem to live in a land of the liars now, the destroyers of life. We don't recognize God anymore in our lives. We don't recognize that God had a plan for people, that he partnered peoples for reasons, and that openly that every person you meet is not exactly on God's plan for your life, but might precisely be on God's plan for your life. But you have to be a person of faith to really get the message here. That didn't we have moments of time to make a difference for someone? We have moments of time to say, you know, I'm not going to make fun of this guy. I'm going to go. I'm going to talk to him like a real person. And I'm going to find out what's going on. And I'm going to see what I can do to help because he's reached out to me. Of all the people on this planet, he's chosen me because of something I've said, something I've done, someone I'm with, or any other reason. He's picked me. It's not just because I'm popular because I'm not. My show's off the air. I'm not online. I don't know. But when I see celebrity people and hosts really making stupid fun of their guests by scaring them to death or other little things, I think what a waste of a time together. Why couldn't we learn about that person's soul? What makes them tick just enough to let people feel like they can love that person even more and support them even more with their discretionary dollars at the box office or other places like rock and roll centers or whatnot. In life, we have moments of time that we'd love to meet Oprah, we'd love to meet the Dalai Lama, we'd love to meet some of our favorite card creators like Doreen Virtue, although I'm not sure if she's reshifted the religious right or not, but she is a person who did a lot of psychological studies, unless all that was a lie. She has produced a legacy of helping people to find their faith, and openly, there's a lot of people of faith I'd like to see, and I'd love to go to Italy once with someone I love, walking hand in hand in the streets, because I love that film, A Little Romance. I don't remember if that's exactly the, the title of it now, but it was a great film about a little set of friends and how they cared for each other in tough times. In life, we have moments of time to help people. We have moments of time to celebrate the soul of other human beings and lift them up so that not only will they glow the light of the Lord, but our own souls will be lit as well. You see, you never know what you're going to learn from someone if you don't talk to them. You never know what you could produce in life if you don't be a producer or a director and helping other people to create lives that they long to live. When you think you're going to ruin a person's right to their life, you've just become a destroyer on the path with Satan. And I promise you, the Lord is not pleased. Now, this has been Blake Enson talking about real life, real relationships, real time, real things, real opportunities to say, you know what? I've decided to live in the light of the Lord. The house of the Lord is mine, and the magic of the Lord will come to my life when I start loving more on the people who ask me for help. 
and I will do whatever it takes to prove I am a pastor, if I am one, in the house of God. To live unselfishly, to live unfettered, to live undetained by my idiotic opinions about things I really know, know what God feels about. Thanks for listening.